Okay, so this is going to be the final content lecture of the day. And the topic of the final lecture is uh, Cedar Society and the Nuclear Disarmament. You are very disarmament in the nuclear weapon. So, Dr. Alan Cohen is the director of the CNN Nobel Prize Education Program and also a senior fellow and the professor in the graduate program in the National Policy Society. Widely known for his path breaking history of the Israel Nuclear Program. He is an internationally recognized author and an expert on non proliferation issues focusing on the Middle East and also on moral aspects of the nuclear age. The recording is most admired Israel and the Bomb was published in 1998 in English and in 2000 in Hebrew. The latest work was the one that can be quick with. Israel's Burning with the Bomb was published in October 2010. He has also published dozens of articles in the Prophetic of Jordan, chapters, and appearance. The Catacolian holds a BA in philosophy and a history from Tel Aviv University, an MA in philosophy from York University, and a PhD from the, uh, from, from the University of Israel. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to take the pleasure to, to be with you again. I uh, was here on and off yesterday during the summer the session as you saw me. I had a few words of the in the beginning. And then I was in my office on and off the video, even when you didn't notice the event, I was just watching you via this little little land, this little thing. So I, I know more or less what has been going on. And I really like some of Was the last was John was the last talk? Or there was there was something else? Oh, oh, I mean. You had you had it in your hand, right? Mm -hmm. John Walton was the last one? Okay. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Okay. okay. So, so in any way, way, my talk would be kind of addition to the realistic or more reflective way to add something to what John was talking about, kind of between the obstacles to the government, and I would like to say something about the historical and sociological narrative of the way that society is not culture dealt with nuclear weapons weapon over the last, the last 60 plus years, and in my view, the very important role of society, of civil society, to advance and to promote, uh, if there ever be, uh, a really serious move towards disarmament. Uh, I think it's one of the lessons that we have learned, especially when we are in the early days, we are in the early days, we are in the age of WikiLeaks, we are in the age of uh, a lot of open information, social media, and so on, without direct involvement. And when I said the right involvement, I mean, not just uh, the, the kind, kind of, uh, um, you know, and I'm going to say more about it in, 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 in the following, this is kind of very, very overview, you know, but, uh, but during much of the Cold War, the focus of the discussion, to the extent that it moved to society beyond the sort of government and officials, which much of it, and this is a very, very important point, was secret, was considered to be classified by. But, but it was a little bit beyond that. It was a very, very much elite policy. That is to say, a very small, very tiny group of intellectuals, many of them were people in the kind of the system of the revolving doors that moved in and out of government, sometimes very senior position government, to a few think tanks, and they wrote some editorial that was in the important paper. But it was not something that it during most, not the entire, but at most of the nuclear age, it was not something that had been discussed in a serious way, in a root, grasp fashion by civil society. The nuclear issue, unlike most issues that we discuss in democracy, 
during much of the time of the, of the, of the nuclear age, not the entire, again, there was a few islands and there was a few words about that. I mean, it's interesting, I was looking for John, and John and I, even though John is younger than me, quite significantly, uh, we, we moved, moved into business. his business. Uh, around the same time, he was, I think, uh, high school, I was already just finishing my PhD, but this was in the early 1980s, when there was, for, not for the first time, but in the most comprehensively and perhaps in the, the largest way, an island of civil protest against uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, he mentioned the, uh, what, what brought him was the big uh, march at New York City in front of the uh, uh, UN building and then all the UN building and all that. Those kind of things were in tens of cities all over the world. In particular, North America and in Europe. And it was quite unusual. Many new groups of very kind of professionals from physicians, to engineers, to teachers, and others started to be interested in a subject that was almost, not entirely, but almost at the level of Sanru. Civil society that has not been in the known issue. We don't understand much of it. Most of it is secret. Most of it is for the, those who have access, who either know today or have known in the past those secrets, and now they are the experts. But what do we know? And this was actually for during much of the Cold War. Now, in the early ages, there was a number of years in the history of the time time of the little process. So, if the way to get us to the use of the energy of the cell, like I my own teacher in there just started at the same time, I'll say a few words of my own. Perfect interaction to, to the country because, like all of us, most of us, it is not just an intellectual issue or even just a professional issue. It's, it's, it's something that, at least for me, it plays a certain role of personal slash moral responsibility as a citizen. No, no, that it is a scholar and, you know, as, uh, as an article mentioned, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not I did not study kind of political science and international relations. I know something about it over the years and I read all kind of reading, but I came to do some political philosophy. And my personal philosophy issue started from philosophical questions. From questions about morality of the parents, and there are some very interesting questions about the morality of parents. It is something which is so obviously immoral to carry out that it was to use nuclear weapons where so many innocent the people are going to be perished. Is it okay? Is it permissible? Is it allowed to use it as a threat? Because to use it as a threat, in order to threat it, to be real, to be the language of the political philosophy, to be credible, the threat you ready to carry it out. But if it's immoral to carry it out, what about the threat itself? And there are also questions about the credibility of the subject. There are what we call the more and more questions. More questions. Question. And this is an issue that some philosophers are interested in. So I was a young in my late twenties, at the time, in the early ages, that uh, I was just finishing my LPD at the University of Chicago. I was at Washington University, the Louis in the early in 1982. It was the year of 81, 82, of all these big marches. This was the early Reagan administration. And suddenly, almost out of nothing, the liberal issue had become a major subject of social and political movement. As I said, unlike most of the nuclear age, when the issue of the public was turn its back towards that subject and did not want to, to be engaged. So it was a short time that the public was engaged. 
outside the city world, we need to do this wide down with interesting. And I personally was just finishing my art PhD, I was pitching in the Buddhist, and I got a telephone call from a very good friend of mine, another philosopher, who finished two years ago, and then he's in the building. And then he said to me, and you know, I knew almost nothing about this other way. I knew was curious. I was, um, I felt there was something very special about it. I wasn't here when John was talking, but I heard you, and I showed he made you the example that, you know, nuclear material, fission material that, that is to the core of the nuclear bomb. If you talk about it, like, right to it, big orange. And there is, it's amazing that if you compress, right. if you slow load that, that little material, little material, material before all five or six kilograms of plutonium, and you bring this thing called critical change, or heard something about that, the identification has a very little material that weighs on four or five or six kilograms, the full city would be destroyed. And I was with the big Greek philosopher, he used to tell us, he says, that a philosophy starts with wonder. And for me, it was a wonder. I mean, the fact that there is something very puzzling in Pisces. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer, the strategic director of the, um, of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, used to call it there is something sweet about it. Uh, John used another word for forever, he used it also about the, the allurement of a Muslim woman. I mean, on the one hand, it's great, and you'll see the other kind of kind of rush, rush, so it's a smooth, smooth, evil, you know, you're going to be finished for the first time in that particular historical point around, you know, 1944, 1945. So, so, so for me, when, when my friend Steve Lee called me the other, what about us, you meant he and I, doing some study, some collection of essays, but what philosopher can say about this subject that you can so it it has a relevance to me. It it has a certain kind of appeal to me. And you know, even though I was involved in something else, I was you know, like what most PhD students do shortly after the finish, you know, the yeah. common thing is to put your PhD and try to the book. And to, you know, to, 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 to submit it, uh, revise it with reason to have it, and then it's going to common practice that as, as many do. I personally, and I was in advanced stages of doing that, and I put everything in my and I started to read and study a great deal of essential weapons from history to the politics, of course, to the physics, to the science, and then around that anthropology, culture, and all that of, of, of nuclear weapons. The result was that for a number of years, he and I put together some 26 essays. And the result was one of the first books that came out, uh, from a sort of kind of essays on the nuclear age, called Nuclear Weapons and the Future of Humanity. This is actually my first contribution that came out in 1986, my first uh, contribution to, to this subject. Anybody know about the, uh, how did you show it? Dante Inferno? I can't get it. It's not Dante, but you are, I think, your right direction. Say it again, yeah? Dermer? Dermer, right. And I think it's called the Four Apocalypse. And he did, we, we, we thought about nuclear weapons, this was still, 86, it's still, you know, within the range of the Cold War, and, uh, one of the developments here is that, that some people ask about the terms, to what extent, beyond the generality of the terms, but to what extent the term has worked, or to what extent living under the terms, successfully, has been simply a mark of being lucky. Maybe some combination of luck and work. So, so my own personal introduction to this subject was very much within the context of what, first to extend the group of people who care about this issue, it was clear that until that point, very few people care about this issue. It wasn't clear at the time exactly why 
I wasn't very fluent in the sociology of all that, we had to talk in a few minutes, in the history of all that, I knew very little about it. But it was almost like going to this forbidden land that I know personally that, that more, more and more we should know. know. And just yeah. as philosophers, just as physicians and engineers and other scholars to pave the way, I thought philosophers too should ask some philosophical questions. Because there is something very quality of the wonder about this awful weapons and the impact that they're going to have again the, the little strain of the setting of the armament the little amount of four or five kilograms in the grip, you know, a grapefruit form if widely imploded could make so much unequal uh, damage. So, you know, we came up with, with this issue. But I remember this one of the ideas that Steve and I, Steve and I are good friends of these days. We are now, you know, 35, 35, 35, 35, 35 years older. So we're not a people who just were introduced to the subject. And he has written a great deal. He remains a philosopher, but he wrote, in my view, some of the best and meticulous philosophical works on, on the question of the parent and the relation of the general use as well as the parent. Um, and he, you know, his, his book, I think it's called Moral Restraint of Nuclear Weapons of Some Kind, that's the NLE, LLE, uh, you can even find it on, you know, on the web easily. Uh, and we kind of, so part of the history is moving along the history of the nuclear age, you know, the end of the Cold War, the first Gulf War. In all this, I was academic, that was observing and writing and commenting and went on and all these issues. I, I um, met, met the director of the center in the immediate late 80s in, in uh, Los Angeles. He was a UC at the time and he was a young man and I was a young man and I remember the the sense of, of excitement about talking about it, that, that kind of issue. And then the community, the academic community, that dealt with this issue was very, very small at the time. Uh, my own work was again, and so, so, so what I'm trying to say is that my sense is, was twofold. I mean, I hear also, like, drawn from the side of the idealist, the peace, the peacenik, the philosopher who felt there is something very awesome about it, about it and reminds me of the way way to not to like the like hobby to be such incredible thing if, if nuclear weapons were ever to use. And of course, we learn a great deal of, of realism, including how difficult it is to, to ban those weapons. And indeed, I learned more about the early stages, which I'm going to say more in two minutes, that in the early nuclear state, nuclear age, it wasn't interested in that. So, the, you know, the history gets a sort of meaning. It becomes not just a collection of events, but a narrative. A narrative by which you try to understand the history of the nuclear age, and the way that humanity has dealt with the issue. I'm telling all that because one of my thoughts then, I think it's, it's important to, to solve your interaction with your own feelings. It is not only trying to give them a sense of personal, a sense of the citizenship which are part of that effort to understand or to ask anything about this issue. But I believe that if we leave politics as is, without the role of civil society, no, there is no way to create, to stimulate, and ultimately to, to push forward fundamental changes. These are broad changes, but the possibility for the might changes in the whole framework. And the role of civil society to change and as John told you, a great deal of the commitments to the weapon are not international, are not strategic. Of course, strategy and politics are justifying the terrorists Standard of the relation between states, promises, 
defend our land and all the private elites, the elites, the politics at the level of the state. But there is a lot of very concrete interest. Tens of thousands of people are employed. You know, in the year from the Manhattan Project, which was already more than 200,000 of Americans were involved in one way or another part of the project over the years. So it's a very deal of uh in error that he called it in the terms of domestic politics. There is a great deal of money that is involved. And to change and to move away, I mean one of the danger after the Cold War is the movement from not from involvement of fear, but the movement from those things both from fear and fear into apathy. To move nuclear weapons, to delegitimize nuclear weapons, this is something that cannot be done by an all head of those who say, whether, you know, the one who did it in 2007 and 6, the big one, you know, um, Nan and, uh, Kissinger and, uh, Schultz and all those and, and, uh, Perry. But, but, but it needs to be the society said, said something like very, very frequently. It needs to be the issues. Uh, from a person, an election campaign is not an issue played almost no role whatsoever. There is a sense of somewhere where you may need to comply and have a, we're curious with the phone numbers. The cost is not that happy. We feel comfort and there is a sense of I give full sense of, you know, we can it. it's not, it's not something urgent. By the way, one of the most irresponsible that I've ever heard of you, but the last question is that the issue of environmental change, climate change, hardly play a role in the discussion in America, which, in my view, personal view, is shame. But anyway, back to, to, to our topic, the questions of the role of civil society, I've always felt it's very, very important. And just to, to, to finish you about my own little personal narrative, my own personal narrative, and then we're going to go to our larger personal narrative of the of the age. In the late 80s, I came back to my own country in Israel. And I realized that in Israel, it's even that kind of aspect of the detachment of society and the lack of involvement of society, it is even much larger there. If it is compounded, it is essentially a national radioactive issue. It talks about the group. I'm mean, using the word radioactive in the program than the story, but it's a total taboo. Nobody says that. As some of you know, uh, Israel has not been aware of six nuclear states that require and possess the deployment of the weapons, but it's the only one, and nobody actually most people are not fully aware of that, or not, and if they were, they do not really comprehend the full meaning of all that. People do not realize that Israel has never found the occasion to openly declare to its neighbors, to its own people, that it has a weapon. In other words, in other words, right, 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 was invested into this business. It was not easy. And yet, to this very day, my research in the got the weapons capability around the late 60s, in 1967, they already had improvised capabilities that they couldn't demonstrate, had prime or had the occasion called for. The occasion needs to be a very emergency that you need to demonstrate capability. It's 1967, today we're 2012, and Israel has never acknowledged from that time to today, all of the country country to have nuclear weapons. The result is that the entire issue in Israel is outside by law, not just by the desire of the public, but the public is part of it. It will not protect the public. The public is, it is uncomfortable not to not have it. The citizenry of the society. But by law, it's not allowed to refer in Israel directly to the presence of nuclear weapons. Israel has a censorship, military censorship, that does not allow it into the country because it was never advertised, never, time, never right. announced it. There is a censor of all this, all this material that is being 
print in the media, especially about the issue, such as the military issue, has to be submitted and has to be clear and to be sent back to the editors and to the writers, and then it's for the whole day in the print. And that censor does not allow ever that the paper of our country or the government, that the paper would refer directly to the Israeli nuclear weapons. So you have to, he always adds, it's becoming sort of ritual, but he always adds according to court sources. So it's referred to Israeli nuclear weapons, comma, according to court sources, comma, and then it continues to say what it is. So to keep this, I call it facade, that the country has never acknowledged to have nuclear weapons. Now, under that kind of circumstances, and the I of kind of kind of you realize, realize that there could not be a real discussion. Because of real discussion, everything is defined in the existence of the weapon is defined in that country, in Israel, and Israel considers itself to be all most of the very no liberal weapon side of the city, right? So that issue, that that attitude makes the nuclear issue all the public discussion. It's not something, it's all, every aspect of that is either classified or not part of the discussion. So you can even discuss it in the legislation, in the open session. It doesn't mean it's not being discussed at all. But it's discussed and the budget is being dealt with in a very tiny body, subcommittees, highly privatized, by never ever with, with public availability. It's in, 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 in Tiny little elite notes, and the result is that there is no any economy today, there is almost no any economy today. You can today, you can talk from today until tomorrow, and they do know from today until tomorrow that you run, but they don't talk about it themselves. And then the question is, how can the public have a real meaningful discussion about Iran if you don't put into the question the fact that they themselves have no weapons? I'm saying this for me personally. It was a great interest, time has come at least to understand that it's a scholar, but again, I thought it was a scholar, but all the citizens, what is the structure, the social, cultural, political structure that allows that to be unique? Because, because I, I understand that they hate to remember me, that Israel is perhaps a limit case, the most extreme case, in the one continuity that was right next to us, the deep features of the nuclear age in terms of the involvement of civil society. Of course, in America or the UK, there is much more discussion, but as uh, I heard sort of mentioned the two, maybe you said a little bit, and that's fair. France, for example, a country that already has nuclear weapons from 1960, not a very, and yet the public turned its back to discuss this issue. They like the level of the weapons and they don't know about it. So it's really it's an extreme, but it's one, one, one continuous like reflecting something that is that going on just that of that 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 It reflects something with some universal aspect that has to do with the nuclear age. So, so I would be intrigued by that and I thought at the time I kind of do some kind of study. I proposed uh I remember actually in 1989, 1990, I was lucky to receive that kind of grant. I first moved to MIT. I was heading a small project at SMIT, the Center for International Relations, that dealt with moving well to the Middle East, and so again, kind of interesting how events in the world mixed with events in our personal life, in our own case. I moved to MIT just shortly before the Gulf War, because the first Gulf War before the Iraq in the way. It was at that time that Saddam Hussein made a big threat, including some of the members. Remember, you know, they're not all old, young as I have been, but it's the most of you, I think, relatively young. Saddam Hussein was saying that he's going to burn half of Israel with chemical weapons, which is going to. Do. And there was a great deal of, of tension in the world that led to the Cold War. Personally, and how it personally and globally first connected, my good friend and colleague from MIT, a man called 
nuclear engineer, nuclear physicist, and then called Marvin Miller, and I we had this little project. We went to the UN. We went, uh, at that time, the Egyptian ambassador, at that time, President Mubarak was talking. Let's have it. I'm going to do the web to start launching nuclear free zones for the whole Middle East. It was a kind of interesting idea. I put together all of them, not just nuclear weapons. And we thought perhaps it's appropriate to explore that. I mentioned again because 20 years later we are still digesting the same kind of issues. And if we met at the Egyptian Embassy in the UN, uh, a well known established ambassador, his name was Henry Mosel, I learned he kind of the former minister of Egypt, and later he became the, uh, the Secretary General of the Arab League. And a young aide, diplomat, and he was first secretary, but he was still that he is promising. His name was Nabil Fahmi, and we know it, we knew the name Fahmi because his father was, was the foreign minister of Egypt during the 70s. Well, over the years back, then Nabil Fahmi became the ambassador of Egypt to the United, to the United States for a long time, for more than a decade. He was involved in the very, 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 in the real range of maybe like other kind of real security. And now he is kind of a colleague, he's the dean of uh, the School of Social Science at the American University in Cairo, and he's also a member of CNS. So it's again I'm sort of mentioning all this to show that personal and general things in, in history about this nuclear age and nuclear narrative are kind of combined. But for me it's questions of the role of the public society. Uh, in the specific context of Israel, but also in the very broad global world, it is very critical for changes, change of the policy. In the global context, it became clear to me that if we ever fulfill the demand of our democracy, that in a very loose and ambiguous somewhat language called for making fast towards general government in the most uh, expedient time on some kind of media language that reflects that that kind of thing is as soon as possible, something like that, it will occur to me that without involvement of, of open society, of civil society, it would be very difficult, probably impossible to do it. And as we realize, uh, even if the President of the United States, part of the unpersonal position is that the world is without political weapons, he does not have the political power to do it in his own lifetime in the own White House. In this case, there are all sorts of other political but even if you put all the power on that kind of issue, you could not understand that. You need to have, to have the force for the involvement of the civil society. So with this in mind, it is a very kind of general introduction about the subject and myself and my own involvement in that subject. I want to, to, to go in and to make a few, a few general points along the other line. And I bought a few books that somewhat reflect that. Uh, and, and I'm saying it, it's, it's, it's very strong in my mind because I think in your introduction with the students, it is it is very important to realize that. It's very important to emphasize that. Their involvement, their involvement in this subject is not just another subject to be treated with neutrality. It's a subject that for many of us and for over the period, it was also an issue of such as ash ash. And for many of us, it has to become, to become all of this primarily intellectual today. We uh, all, once you are no longer young, you you become different. But it doesn't mean that we, that, 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 that we don't know that it's important. We do. And I think it is something that the young people are the most, could be the most enthusiastic to take it seriously and to, to believe that, you know, that you can, that you can shake the big walls around this, this subject. And you need to, to shake those walls ultimately to, to break down those, those walls. And that can be done only with the world only with the involvement of civil society. So with this in general, and by the way, feel free, if you have specific questions, always to just follow me. I mean, I will have some room for big questions, but if you have some specific questions, you know, some 
to elaborate. Feel free, I'm not reading the Bible, and it's okay. We are just a few. Semi conversation is not a speech. And I'm not going to look very carefully in the notes. You'll get it in the R1, and it will be part of the record of, of this workshop. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is a very informal kind of kind of conversation. Feel free to read something, 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 whenever you know what you like. Perhaps the fundamental issue that's involved in this business, in this uh, engagement with the of, of civil society has to do with legitimizing or delegitimizing Mr. Weapon. The validity or the lack of validity that a society gives to this weapon. And not many people realize but from the very dawn of the new age, and and I'm slightly unusual here, saying that my interest is largely historical, to some extent philosophical. I'm not from the political science, and some of the I have a strong interest. So the, the issue of history is uh, sort of my heart. My heart. Um, it was very, very, very to many people the, the secret under the secret walls of the Manhattan Project, that the one of the elements will become known, will become public knowledge, uh, it's going to change politics, and politics, if politics, international politics, wants to address this challenge, international politics needs to maybe there is something about the nuclear weapon, the inherent, but it is a discovery, the inherent issue about the nuclear weapon that it defies the traditional international politics. In particular, it will come to the issue of sovereignty. So, for example, uh, even before the world, there were a number of dead memos that were written by a number of bodies that the Secretary of Defense at the time, Henry Stevenson, asked the same thing, thing about, about the war and, and then the implication of the bomb. And all of them said that it's not going to remain secret. It's going to likely, you know, it's a specific knowledge that others will have as well. And you cannot get it monopoly for too long. And therefore, a world with nuclear weapons, with many nuclear weapons, by many countries, is a highly dangerous world. And, you know, since at that time only the United States had it, one of the issues that, one of the early ideas that came along, and later on, 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 articulated in a long memo that the Department Secretary of Defense, Mr. Simpson, wrote to President Truman just when he was about to leave the White House in November 1945. He said to the President, he wrote a number of issues, including the concern about the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States and the future and all that. You know, the, the shape of the post world was not yet clear, and the role of the bomb in shaping that post-World War II was, was not clear at all. But he kind of warned the president, to the president, the nuclear issue presents you a great deal of challenge. And maybe he didn't use the word I'm about to use, the legitimize, but the idea was there, was implicit, implicit there. He says that, that uh, maybe it's my mind to think, think about betting the bomb, about finding some mechanism that would not allow to be free from the bomb, that ultimately would ban the bomb from, from the face of the earth. And of course, uh, in the period after, so, so, so this was already the idea, the idea was from the top, from the level of this, you can call it free, those elite people who deal with the bomb, the request of the president, maybe it would be the right thing because of the unique and the unprecedentedness elements about the bomb to 
not to allow the bomb to be spread, not to make the bomb, in my language, legitimate, not to legitimize the bomb as an instrument of form like tanks and aircraft and other weapons in the system. There is something, something very special about it. There is something, something unique about it. And that unique compelled us with a very special action. So that idea was already on the level of the top. But one of the things that happened after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I always felt that, um, that Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and there is, to be is a great debate about the morality or immorality of those acts and what them was right or not right to do what the United States is designed to do. And I'm really for that is the fact that the president has no choice because it was so much the mechanism and the process was already on the wall that in fact he didn't make any decisions. It's going to be authorized something that it will already be emerged with so strong that it will already more the bad dropping the wrong. So children never made a decision, big decision about that. And I believe some of the truth there. And yet it's really interesting to give the right of the fact to ask questions about the rightness of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And some people are next to the distinction between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But all this all right now, we're on our own now, on our own limited, limited position for this uh, conversation. But it is important just to say that the images of the devastation that happened in Japan was such that it had impact, deep impact on the society. In the period 45 or 46, there were many, many books, including one book that was become very, very well known, One World for None, that was presenting the venture, the saying that the emergence of this weapon brings about incredible threat, a threat that either we'll be able to live with this world and find a way to remove the direct threat, or we will be able to do that and do that Um, what was the famous, uh, book about, uh, that wrote this author about, uh, that was published in Time Magazine about, uh, the Russian Nagasaki, um, every time was this picture, it was every, and then he became a book, it was, very, very, very bad seller. Uh, maybe it will come to me. But the point is, the, the issue and the images, the physical and the graphical images of this, the devastation that it was not known, was being, was discussed by the public. There was something very compelling about it, and it was discussed by the public as a possibility of action. In parallel, the President, President Truman, did take seriously uh, the advice of um, of Hitler. And he put the various kinds of bodies to study and to recommend men what, what to do to do the bomb, the bomb. And this was the idea, this was the time that only one country had it, had it, the United States. And that country, in a very intense effort, was able to produce a few of those items which two of them were used in anger to end the war, they were dropped, and it ended the war quickly in uh, 1945. But the infrastructure, the world infrastructure, it was not a school or infrastructure, but it was infrastructure that was prepared for the task of the war. And had a decision made not to support it, you could have been dismantled. No, no, no. Well, no. But you could have been dismantled. Indeed, Los Alamos and the various other elements of part of that infrastructure of Greece and Chicago and in uh, Washington State, where it was the production of the plutonium and the production reactor that produced the plutonium. All of these were, for a while, kind of on hold. No major investments were made. The question was, was it to keep it, or to let it go, let it decay, or let it on to, 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 to dismantle it. And there was this kind of, kind of friend, friend, see, see, what, what, what little is it going to be going to be done? Time? And President, uh, and I call those discussions, it was primarily the United States, because the United States was kind of had it and had to make its own national decision about it. 
But it was clear those decisions are not going to be just American decisions. To internationalize the food energy and to ban it.
Many people said that he wanted especially to she overdrive and to sabotage the plan that it was on the design of the real framework, the real originators, um, actually from the Indian side, which is the equity of the State Department, the Indian was the big guy, he was the one who built the Tennessee Valley big project, uh, and he wanted to sabotage it. Essentially, he was not ready, he was convinced by Grove that he could not be one for the United States to give up its big stick. The result was, it was submitted to the UN, the United Nations, in early or in the spring of 1947, in a much tougher language. And within weeks, Stalin, not that surprisingly, rejected it. And with the rejection of it all, that perhaps the symbolic event that ended this Two years, and there was a great deal of open debate, or partial open debate, yeah, partial part of the world, in, in, in uh, very, 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 the real view of Truman, as I said, that maybe he wanted also, and he just wanted to, you know, keep the motion, to let the motion go. When, when, when he gave those committees and those documents to circulate and those hopes to, 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 to be moved around. Uh, but essentially it was, by default, the legitimization of the law. And indeed, two years later, uh, which was not known initially, because that to a large degree by espionage, the Soviets were able to achieve that kind of technology and to explore their own bomb in 1949 or 1949. Essentially, the world was doomed to live with the bomb. So the early effort to try to illegitimize the bomb, it failed to come to, and it failed to be the, with the uh, rejection of the whole plan and maybe the very framing of the whole plan was the recipe for that kind of failure. What we had after that, and um, that is the beginning of the whole world, and the speech of church in the world in 1946 and 1948, is semi-officially considered by historians as the beginning of the Cold War, the formation of, on the one side, from the west, the NATO alliance, on the east, the Warsaw Pact, the Communist Alliance and both sides by the United States has more war initially, initially, but we, we are living under essentially under under conditions of arms race initially without limitation of further. So for example in nineteen forty nine, nineteen fifty, in response to the um Soviet explosion. When, uh, President Truman had decided what we are going to do now, all those deliberations, the deliberations that led essentially to huge expansion of the nuclear nuclear structure. Because until essentially 47, 48, the nuclear structure was in the hands of the In the year 46, 47, Los Alamos was in disarray because there was no political decision about the future. And in many ways, no new money, I mean, it was somewhat to maintain what we had. But the United States, for, for some time, did not have any immediate, ready, available for use of the weapon. So only by late 47 and 48, the part of it was really nice, so to speak, this. And by the decision that the President Truman made in response to the Soviet explosion, it was a decision to get a lot of money to, in terms of, so they need modern, 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 the to, to put new ele- elements, new facilities, and the movement towards smaller weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, and then the numbers are growing and multiplying very, very quickly. But the most important thing, the most is debate about what they call at the time the super. What is the super? Super movie. The term or two phase weapon, the weapon that essentially makes atomic weapons to be a tiny dwarf in relation to the new weapons. I mean, the, the destruction power of the thermonuclear weapon is hundreds of times larger, more powerful than 
the early fission bombs, this is the movement from fission to fusion, and we call it fission and fusion, and this was something that people studied, and people understood started to understand already during World War II, took so the wise fundamental Heller was the man who was the, the scientist who was behind it, but this was not developed into during World War II, and it was the decision of President Truman in late 49, 1950 actually, to develop the H bomb. Now my point is, that decision was done secretly, the public was not involved, not a demonstration, there was no any involvement in the to the society. Now this will give some sense of what will happen during much of the Cold War. And you can describe it almost like, like I said it the way the element of security and the security of the public and to that these issues are much of it most of it is secret that other people are supposed to know, and there was a sense of we not only are not supposed to know it, but we don't even want to know it. There was something very uncomfortable about it. One way to describe it, and again, it was not understood so much at the time, but from the story or I don't know exactly it is, it's a certain kind of bargain was struck. One can call it a bargain with the devil, bargain with the tom. And the bubble and the bargain was something like the following. We're going to give legitimacy to something which is terrible, which is immoral, which is evil, the wrong. But the justification that was given is that we we're not going to use it. It's almost all the other things are not going to use it. It's so terrible and so evil that to be rational means not to use it ever, ever. And then we prove that the most element of the problem is the problem, the problem but it's not, it's not going to be used, but that will be promised it will not be worse, worse. Now remember, now remember that, that what was, was the lesson in World War II and in general. general. The lesson, the lesson was, was that look what happened that led to World War II. The rise of Nazism and fascism in Europe, and of course the rise of militarism. The bomb and part of that, I call it the city of from, from, uh, from the death of the story, from, from, from the old mythology, the, the bargain with the, the devil, the Christo bargain, was such that where you were, as the United States, will get, you don't need to have major armies. You don't think to put everybody to to be in the military society. The problem is well military. You are involved in that, and that would promise that we'll be able to recover our lack of the big damage of World War II, and you don't even have to have everybody to go to 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 military service or military service to go to the world with short or and all that. You're not going to have have military side side with the culture. So the bomb gave us certain kind of promises. Promises of parents and promises of non military society. And in the return, we, we said by default, we legitimized, legitimizing the bomb and making the bomb as a promise that it will not be used, but it will prevent war. And that's the parents. And the parents began with the big, you know, global, and as I did in our group, we studying, but Policymakers and scholars and about various aspects of, of the terms and to what extent it's working on. But this was a banner, you can call it, a broad banner, that allowed the society not to be involved. But that is the excuse. It takes the piece. It takes the piece by technology and design and all those sorts of pretty, 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 And we are Detached. We are not involved. We delegate our authority to our leaders and to what extent they decide. And the fact is that the leaders, I think John also mentioned that, and it's true in every country that has, that had no clear weapon and this world experience. The leaders do not like what they were either. Either at the level of the top, the top, the president, the prime minister, or even at the level of ministers. 
So there was always, it was the day, the people who were supposed to ultimately be our leaders, the fine, who were approved, and took the therapy. And, you know, the role of the religious legislation in most places was very small. In the United States, it was a problem of the United States, and it was a problem of the United States, and it was a And the idea was that, um, you know, the new work will provide a better kind of role to the, to the, to the propriety of the people. Yeah. I need that thing to run in and I'm trying to add because uh I find it very interesting and I wanna I wanna just pull up a couple of things. Um so the thing about sort of society uh, uh on the same side of the small kind of and I know that you have exactly said that you're just saying creating a stronger social society makes a healthier society, makes a healthier government. That's that sort of thing. thing. But that's the, the ideal, ideal world. world. I, 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 I'll just put this to you, so that you at least see where I'm coming from, which is why I'm hedging my full commitment for a better civil society playing a better role in nuclear policy. Mm-hmm. Do you think, for instance, if we just look at uh, the American mm-hmm. Network News, that American mm-hmm. Network News, when it was once dominated by three companies, three networks, uh, is better was better in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s than it is than our news coverage today and the going into the second decade of the 21st century when there are a million, it seems like a million different news sources and blogs and information sources and everybody has a chance to say anything they want to in response to anything that's said. Do you think that the act of the good model of news is improved by the greater democratization of the act of discussion of news than it was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s when a very few people could control and enterprise and enter the news that we had? Well, it's a very complicated question and, and tons of, of studies that are about that. That's very, very tricky. I mean, these are the landscapes that you have to do. I mean, for our subject, what is important is that and I think a little about it instead of it. And I think this anti liberal movement of the early 80s was a critical independent creative. As I said, not, not the first, first time, time, but in the in first, first, but the next time, 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 a situation that knowledge is more and more available. And I feel that period. Uh, and I can say it even in the It was so difficult for people to know how to come out of the world to know accurately. Information about the middle of the you know, I mean, it is sick with the case of the progressive magazine, the or a story about the age bomb, and the like, the like, the very, very much government, very kind of action against progressive magazine, all of that in the 80s. But in the 80s, there was explosion of much more information. You're right that the landscape of the time was primarily, you need, if you have a landscape and you want to publish, you need to find a publisher that will publish you, and if you want to purchase something, through the media, it has to be either the print media, which was, you know, each town has one or two or three papers and that's it, or through the three national networks, and in, in TV today is, is a very, very different landscape. There was a certain kind of cachet, and there was a certain amount of um, credibility to view this work through the, 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 the main media, because it was more challenge of scrutiny pieces of traction information. But at the same time there were both the World Act and the there is the National and and the citizens or even us have to be men much more careful and judgmental ourselves in terms of deciding credible it's not credible it's not credible it's not credible it's not credible how how we should they take it so there is much more either to decide whether it's serious or not serious. So it's a very different kind of kind of uh, world and environment and landscape that you had to act. But from my perspective, the fact is that until the 80s, and the 80s was close towards closure, the end of the Cold War, but until the 80s, there was, frankly, much, much less open information about this issue of nuclear weapons. And even about the diplomacy of nuclear weapons. Uh, governments and very kind of organizations control that information much more tightly. 
So it gives it a quality, it gives a C different in terms of quality, it gives an excellent information. An excellent information is the key for your involvement of social science. Right, because you do not have a meaningful meaning for that question if you don't, don't, don't have an excellent kind of information and broad understanding of the subject and exposure to argument back and forth. I mean, it's, it, it's impossible to do the game with the students to have a teacher involved and students involved in that kind of age uh, before the 80s. Uh, it, is, it is very, very difficult. I don't know how many of you remember those days. You were probably very young. Um, but uh, maybe not all of you, but, but many of you. But uh, it's, it's a very different kind of, kind of uh, I mean, I said this was not the only time. In the late 50s, and again, in response to something that was very dramatic and could not be a favorite, that is, it was a, the big, overground, the private ground, tennis that took place, both in the United States, primarily, and everyone else, 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 Explosions onward close to the North Arctic. I mean, think about it. It's thousands of times, tens of, many, many thousands of times more than he was in the United States. And he was 60 megatons. This is, by the way, the Soviet pilots were involved in this. Some of them got radiation and then died after the death. He was a city member giving him how to save you to the crew that were involved in this. But the result of that was another effort, or was another aspect of the human all of the Southern Pacific Society. There were quite a number of demonstrations in various places in Europe in the late 50s and the 1950s about putting an end at least to the panic. And when 1953, there was this agreement about, uh, it was called PT, the Partial Test Ban Treaty. Or maybe the test and the same thing. That agreement in July 1993. That agreement uh, was to some extent brought about, even though it had the and all that, but it was, it, it was not the end of the legitimized nuclear weapon. It was built as in one aspect of nuclear weapons test, not even all that, only that which are about the atmosphere, but even that, which is achievement, but it's not a huge achievement, not changing the entire direction of the nuclear age, was that through involvement of civil society. It was not just a beginning of the civil society, for a short time, this was perhaps the only time intervened, the only time after 45, 47, this kind of meeting of the civil society. But I can tell you, you could not have more than two months, and you gave him the there was, for a number of years, an association that was done with almost no involvement and knowledge. Almost entirely quiet, even though it was probably following Irish or the U.S. and the Jewish family, but then the negotiation of what would become the non-proliferation treaty during the 60s, from 1965 to 1968, uh, and that is what we thought it, but the intense negotiation for about two or three years in the mid 60s, and it was signed after the 58, it came into the entry in 1970. Those negotiations were all public, it was very, very limited in role in that. And again, the emphasis was not the deal with most of the weapons, but about the non proliferation. Yes, there was this vague element of the armed combination, it's the manipulation of the energy utilization of the weapon, weapon, but it's what left in this new Ambiguous article of physics, which does not go for a specific time, and it does for, you know, verbal declaration to be nice, bring an end to, to, to the atmosphere, and to, to, to bring about measures of nuclear disarmament. But there was no any concrete sense involved in that. So the number of reasons we can essentially, one way to read it is, you decide the little living service to deal with utilization of nuclear weapons, essentially, but what it really does is it delegitimizes non-proliferation, indeed, but in a many ways 
it does legitimize the possession of those states who had nuclear weapons and who possessed the nuclear weapons until the very specific day, had to be January 3rd, 1967, that made it a photo explosion before that time. time. In the end, they had the end of the science, science phase for trying to enter the under the that that covered the nuclear weapon states, the United States, the Soviet Union, and then you were there, really, the bottom of the NPD, and two others did not sign, but they were on hold, and later, when you come under the later, the city line, this is the China and Japan, what was in the time, what was in the time, what was in the but both of them were essentially legitimate nuclear weapon states under the NPD, because they exploded before that date, January 1st, 1967. So, so the one way to read the NPD is unheeded in that NPD, because you see, some kind of air problems for the government and English organizations and whatever. But what we got more is to legitimize the unique role for the time being, including very limited the pressure of the NPD to disarm the fight with the nuclear weapons. And again, this was still under the very, what they call the banner of Tehran. So, so, what happened, and by the way, I, I wrote this book because the best study Sociological study, 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 and, and, uh, you know, you've been asked how it is, is this monumental work by a colleague, his name is Lawrence Whitner. He's retired now, he was professor of history at the University of the uh, State of New York at Albany. And he did a very three volume study about the involvement of civil society in the effort to be united at all. The first volume is called, uh, One More or one, which is from 1945 to 1953. The second volume is Resisting the Bomb. And again, because he is from the peace, gives it a great deal of attention to the various demonstrations, to the various things, even though politically, in terms of impact, the impact was moderate, and in most cases was not significant. And yet, he did a full volume to what happened in the United States before 1970, because he's a great advocate, he has a great sympathy towards those people. And they were primarily active in the UK. France, there was nothing. In Germany, there was limited, limited, limited activity. activity. Nothing, nothing in the United States. Nothing, so forth. Um, and the last volume is uh, towards the middle of abolition, and it's still a pretty powerful abolition. And that's 1971 to the present. I think the book came out about four or five years ago. The three volumes about this kind of uh, a few things that I wanted to mention just very briefly. How much time we have? Uh, sorry, not so very much. We are half hours, I think. Just a few things I want just, just to mention that there is a great deal of research that can look. It's a question of the democracy with what extent what happened in, during the Cold War gave force to the sense of deep prohibition, deep inhibition about the use of nuclear weapons. There are some people who believe that that is the case. But the question of the validity and the strength of the nuclear taboo is a very interesting. And again, you look at the taboo, but you're not just an expert, even though you have a certain kind of kind of informal normative. There is a book covers both the historical and theoretical aspects of that about the nuclear taboo. Um, there are issues about the security of the parents that led again to the digitization of nuclear weapons. And perhaps finally, just to mention, uh, we in this center, when uh, my good friend and colleague, Christian Lewis, was here a year ago, a year ago, uh, we published a study called Digitalizing Nuclear Weapons, Examining the Political of Nuclear Weapons. It's a collection of number of essays by various kind of people. Um, that were associated with the center. So there is literature about that. I wanted to, to, to be aware, aware of the literature. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to respond. If you don't, you don't. Do you have any questions? We have, may have uh, maybe one or two questions. No? Okay, and also I want to mention that tomorrow morning I'm going to introduce you some uh, useful material for your study, for your students, and some of the articles uh, or resources that might be a little bit advanced, but I did include this particular the daily journal and it was really interesting reading stuff. 
Okay, so thank you, Abner. So if you don't have any questions, let's uh, give him a hand. Thank you.